From taking a look at the future of warfighting tools and techniques to the ways the nation can combat the effects of climate change and sea level rise, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is leading the way on research and development to make our warfighters the most advanced and best equipped and reduce risk to local communities with better engineering tools and techniques. Today, we focus on those research and development efforts during this, our special Engineers Week edition of Core Connection. Once again, welcome to this special edition of Core Connection for Engineers Week. I'm your host, Patrick Bloodgood. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, in addition to its divisions and districts that work with regional and local communities, has the Engineering Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which partners with industry and educational institutions to work on the next generation of technology and techniques our military and engineers will use to solve our nation's toughest problems and dominate on the battlefield. We start this special edition with a look at the research going on into how the U.S. military can quickly repair asphalt, which will help in repairing runways in combat areas. Hey, my name is Ben Cox. I'm a research civil engineer. I work in the airfields and pavements branch of the Geotechnical Instructors Laboratory. And today I want to talk to you about inductive hot mix asphalt, which we call it IHMA. So what we're trying to do with IHMA is create a product or a material that has the convenience of cold mix asphalt, but the long lasting performance of hot mix asphalt. We redesigned IHMA from a regular hot mix asphalt, different aggregate blends and different aggregate materials, or to where basically we can heat it with induction technology, which is kind of like microwaving it. We can take a five gallon bucket and we can heat it in five minutes, which is kind of unprecedented in terms of hot mix uh, technology. So this allows you to take that Wherever you are in the world, you can ship it with you and heat it up kind of like this hot mix asphalt on demand. What this does for the Air Force is now it does not depend at all on how close you are to a hot mix plant or whether it's even running. You can make a hot mix right where you are. And you can make repairs to your airfield that will be immediate and will last and will withstand traffic. For the past few decades, our military has been focusing on winning battles in arid climates. With those conflicts now ended, the focus is shifting to how to win battles in different types of terrain and environments, including frigid ones that can influence both man and machine. We're here at the Quinoa Research Center in northern Michigan, studying the mobility characteristics of different types of military vehicles in different types of snow and extreme conditions. This analysis will help us determine which snows are traversable which can be traversed by multiple vehicles traveling in a convoy, and which are impassable and cannot be traversed. This information will enable maneuver commanders to have a greater understanding of the battlefields on which they fight. This will also enable more effective logistics and lines of support for soldiers who are already forward in the fight. We're here at Keemanaw Research Center studying winter vehicle mobility. It focuses all season impacts on vehicle mobility, and we're studying in a harsh winter environment. The U.S. military has been fighting in the desert for 30 years, but now we have adversaries in northern climates with well-known winter capabilities. So therefore, we're studying mechanisms and processes involved in vehicle mobility over snow and ice and even deep snow to develop models and predictive capabilities for mobility in winter environments. Since ancient times, armies from around the world have been temporarily bridging rivers to move troops, supplies, and equipment. Improved ribbon bridges, used by the Army and Marines, have been around since 2002. Currently, USACE's Engineering Research and Development Center is pushing the bridge system to handle today's heavier equipment. The Family of High Military Low Class Bridging Program is a program that we have here at ERDIC that leverages SMEs across the ERDIC to evaluate the structural response of the improved ribbon bridge when subjected to extreme loading conditions. So we have SMEs across the ERDIC. We have people from the Geotechnical and Structures Lab, from Coastal Hydraulics Lab, from Information Technology Lab. 
We also have the National Guard, the Mississippi Army National Guard involved in it, as well as people from Anniston Army Depot. We're able to look at the Improved Ribbon Bridge. We're able to test it against different loading and hydrodynamic conditions and be able to determine operational conditions in which we can deploy the Improved Ribbon Bridge and subject it to higher weighted vehicles. The Improved Ribbon Bridge is a float bridge that gives the Army the capability to cross um, their military assets across wet gaps that wouldn't be possible otherwise. The type of loadings that we were looking at, the Improved Ribbon Bridge has never been verified to actually be capable of withstanding those types of loads. And we basically incrementally um, started to increase our load cases, not jumping into the heaviest, most potentially damaging load at first, but basically ramping up and, and taking a lot of measurements and inspections in between so that we could safely you know, approach our target goal of the heavier vehicles. In our modeling and simulation efforts, you know, one important load case is to understand when everything is in static equilibrium, you know, the vehicle is basically stationary on the bridge. What are our, our loads and stresses and displacements in the bridge? When we're analyzing things, it's a, it's a lot simpler and a lot of the calculations are better suited to just looking at a static equilibrium case. But when the vehicles are actually moving, um, there's what's called a dynamic amplification factor, and you actually get loads that are higher than what, what you see when the, when the vehicle is stationary. This was done for product manager bridging, who's responsible for acquiring and maintaining the Army bridge systems. What we were looking at is basically over time, the Army tanks have developed more capability and they've also gotten a lot heavier. We bought the majority of our IRB inventory in the 2000-ish time frame. Since then, the vehicles have become heavier than what they were back then. And the question that the Army has for us that we try to answer is, can these existing bridge systems, do they have the capability of handling these heavier loads? The IRB is a robust bridge, and it's, it has some significant capability. It's, it's impressive the amount of load that it's actually able to, to carry. What we will be doing in the future is we are going to take our results from our full-scale static flow testing, and we are going to validate it with our small-scale model testing that we have. And then from our small-scale model testing, we're going to look at different hydrodynamic conditions that we can operate this bridge in and be able to determine the operational conditions that we can deploy this bridge. And that will be the answer that we give the warfighter. We are also looking at doing a rafting configuration for the bridge. In addition to looking at problem sets for our nation's military, USACE is looking at how to make the country more resilient to coastal storms through natural means that are already supplied by Mother Nature. The U.S. coastal population continues to grow, and protecting it from the increasing risk of severe storms is critically important. Coastal dunes can provide a key defense during hurricanes and tropical storms, but more information is needed about how to best maximize this natural protection. A strong dune system along the coast can provide a natural barrier to storm waves and storm surge that frequently occur with tropical storm impacts, especially in the Gulf Coast region, as well as on the East Coast. Um, and this barrier can provide protection to valuable infrastructure that exists inland, as well as really important habitat for specific coastal species like sea turtles, vegetation, and bird species that often lay their eggs in the dune. Previous research done by the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center has shown vegetation plays a significant role in dune stability and that adding biological material during dune construction makes dunes much more resilient against the effects of wave action. One possible method to encourage dune growth by vegetation is to incorporate naturally deposited rack material like seaweed or seagrasses that often wash onto beaches. Because this washed up material can make it difficult for beachgoers to enjoy recreational activities, many communities groom their beaches by raking the rack material from the beach and depositing it to an off-site location. However, this rack may have underlying value in how it can be recycled to improve dune systems. 
The research we're conducting at ERDIC with support from the Regional Sediment Management Program is very important because we're attempting to assess ways to improve dune resiliency by mimicking the natural dune growth cycle. And by utilizing the naturally occurring rack organic material that washes up on the beaches, not only provides the local community with a rack management solution to clean that up, but it will assist with growth of the dunes in a natural way. And by improving dune resilience and dune growth utilizing these natural materials, we are helping to reduce the need for future dune uh, restoration construction projects and maybe even reduce the need for beach nourishment in the future. Erdic researchers are now executing a field study where they're investigating how natural rack that washes up on the beach can be recycled by placing it at the dune to incrementally increase dune stability. In order to determine dune performance and to capture the highest fidelity data, research must take place during coastal storm events, which can pose some logistical challenges. A tropical storm impact can often leave the site inaccessible for a little while if the road is closed, etc. But it is these tropical storm impacts that make field studies so important because we are able to monitor wind and wave conditions and see how that impacts sediment and rack behavior. For example, we can take a look at how wind and waves change over a given event and see if that leads to erosion or deposition along our large scale field site um, and whether that impacts or how it impacts the dunes that have been treated with the rack supplemental material. Measuring those impacts required an innovative approach and collaboration with the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Geospatial Center. The GCGC deployed its camera imaging and terrestrial LIDAR tools to monitor the sediment accretion and dune behavior during storm events and quantify the added sediment mass incurred by this new incremental rack placement method. We have some unique capabilities in comparison to other geospatial labs around the nation. We specialize in three main areas of geospatial science, remote sensing of the environment, GIS and GIT, and high precision geodetic positioning networks. Everything that we do is a survey grade workflow from the terrestrial LIDAR collection to the aerial LIDAR collection. Everything we do is the most precise and accurate spatial model that you can develop of the time uh, based on my knowledge. And so bringing that precision geodetic survey science to the table allows for increased replicability and, more, and better conclusions to be drawn with the data sets period. Measuring those fine scale changes are imperative to actually predicting how dune growth is going to happen and, and future mitigation of impacts from coastal episodic events as well. So we can actually extrapolate at some point, once we get a long enough time series, how long it will take to grow a dune naturally using this rack cycling technique. And so we need to find a good healthy balance between maintaining that value of the beach and maintaining the value of, uh, you know, recreation along the beach. So with this study, we hope to better understand ways that we can tie those two things together. Keep the rack material in the coastal system, um, allow it to add to the ecosystem like it has for many millennia, while keeping the beach clean for people to enjoy. Each year, you stace overseas dredging throughout the U.S. to keep ships and barges moving, which helps fuel our economy. But what to do with that material brought up from our nation's navigation channel is always a challenge for our engineers. Placing the material in approved upland areas or designated ocean sites is where much of the silts and sands end up. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is looking at ways to make better use of that material going forward. So historically, a lot of when it came to dredge material, uh, the perception was is that this sediment was almost viewed as a contaminant. So the, the focus here is what with beneficial use is that we can keep the sediment within its natural system, uh, understand that it is not necessarily a contaminant, that it can, it's a resource that we can use to increase elevation on our wetlands, our low-lying areas, to build natural features to help better manage our navigation channels, uh, whether that be through berms or whether that be through 
uh, levees or any sort of uh, natural infrastructure that we can utilize this sediment for as opposed to removing it from the system. One of the more innovative beneficial use projects that is going on here at the Seven Mile Island Innovation Laboratory, also known as SMIL, is the use of fine grain sediments uh, for beneficial use. Uh, when we say the word beneficial use in dredging, a lot of people will think of beach nourishment, sandy material. Um, and in a lot of our uh, project areas, fine-grained or muddy material isn't adequate for being placed on a beach. We need to find ways to beneficially use muddy material. So with the support of research programs like the Regional Sediment Management Program, the Dredging Operations Environmental Research Program, and the Engineering with Nature Program, uh, the, the work that's being done out here at SMIL uh, will be successful not only now but into the future. The SMIL uh, was actually kicked off a few years ago and there's been several pilot studies and placement studies going on both on the Sturgeon Island and Gull Island here uh, over the last year, year and a half. This is a, a follow-up on that to basically put these platforms out for, for some more long-term monitoring. Um, and then in the fall, we hope to be out here. Uh, the Philadelphia District is going to be doing some more placement. Um, and so we'll have pre-existing pre condition data for that and then be able to monitor through placement and, and following. There was a, a nearshore berm of sediment placed and we have a set of platforms that are aimed at uh, evaluating how that's dissipating wave energy and where that sediment might be moving. Additionally, there was uh, some sediment placed in the interior of the wetland uh, that was in a thin layer placement configuration, so a thin layer dispersed over a wide area. And that's what our other sediment instrumentation is monitoring. It is looking at how that sediment is mobilized in that system, how much might be retained, and, and what is the ultimate fate of it. Is it mobilized and exported out of the wetland or just redistributed uh, in the vegetated areas? So in this particular environment, the shallowness and the limited access is a real challenge. So we have these narrow tidal creeks that we have limited capability to get equipment and materials in. And that presents another problem, which is just limited time of access. So we have to quickly ferry these materials in, get them constructed and get out or spend the night on the salt marsh. <laughs> Best case scenario is the instruments work and they uh, you know, tell us what the sediment is doing. So we don't really have champions here on how it behaves. We're just hoping to learn how the sediment uh, is packaged when it's moving around in the system and that's going to help us determine better where to place the sediment or what uh, expectations we would have on retaining that dredge material in the wetland. Since the late 1800s, USACE has been using mats to help keep the Missouri River from meandering away from its current riverbank. Originally, USACE used willow trees that were cut, tied together, and sunk using large stones. In the 1920s, the mat sinking unit began using interconnected concrete blocks, which continues today. The mat sinking unit places and removes these river taming devices into the Mississippi River seasonally each year. However, the way these items are being placed is going through a major technological overhaul, bringing the process up to the 21st century, which will make it safer and cheaper to complete. So Armor 1 is the replacement for the mat sinking unit, which has been at home in the Vicksburg district since 1948. Uh, so it is a modern day replacement built on three tenants, safety, reliability, and efficiency. One of the things we wanted to do when we designed this is not just repeat uh, and rebuild what we already had in the 1940s, we wanted to bring it up to date with new designs and also add robotics, safety features, and make it fully compliant with all safety and regulatory uh, uh, issues across the Mississippi River to include the Coast Guard standards. So we've spent the last five or so years partnered with the National Robotics Engineering Center uh, here in Pittsburgh. And that has gone through a process of uh, brainstorming, of conceptual design, of CAD drawings leading all the way up to a full-scale working prototype. It represents the largest uh, robotic complex that the National Robotics Engineering Center has ever built. Uh, so very successful project very high visibility project that the Corps of Engineers must have so that we can continue to meet our navigation mission out on the Mississippi River 
uh, just like we've been doing since the 1940s, we're going to continue this in the future. So a very key piece of equipment for us. So we saw a demonstration of the robotics over at the National Robotic Engineering Center, uh, part of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, that very successful demonstration showed us, uh, really showed us how successful that prototype process has been over the last three to four years. So we completed prototyping of the robotics, tested those in September of 2020, and then we saw those test results again today. Some of the things we saw at the National Robotic Engineering Center today were those innovations that we've built into the, uh, the lifting cranes and the mat deck uh, on Armor One. And one of the most obvious ones that you can see uh, out there is how the mat is picked up. It's picked up by the robotics with sensors very carefully raised, angled properly, and then placed on the deck. And this is, to done, this is done to keep from damaging the mat or harming it so we can tie it together easily uh, with the robotics on the deck. Another uh, way that it's innovative out there uh, the mat deck is active, which means that when you put the mat on the deck, it's not just roller sliding it down the slope. There's actually rollers that can move it and adjust it back and forth. And that gives us the alignment we need to make sure the robotics can make the ties. Right now, that's all done by hand. With crowbars and wedges and things like that, it takes a lot of time. Uh, now we can do that automatically. Uh, from here on out, we are building this ship down in Houma, Louisiana at Thomas C. Uh, shipyard. And that will take place over the next year and a half. In December of 2022, we'll take it out on the river, we'll do full up, full trial testing, and then we'll move it to the Vicksburg District for the start of the 2023 mat sinking season. That wraps up this special edition of Core Connection dedicated to our engineers. Thanks for all that you do on behalf of our nation. Tune in next month as we deliver another regular edition of Core Connection. Until then, I'm Patrick Bloodgood, and this has been Core Connection.